and the rest of us are turning to the gospel according to Luke. It is starting to sound a lot like Christmas around here with this story. We'll be looking at the Christmas story pre-Christmas uh, over the next few weeks as half the church departs for Children's Church. Uh, Matthew and Luke are unique in the sense that we uh, see the narrative of the Christmas story. In Matthew and Luke and John, we, uh, the apostle begins with the eternality of, of Jesus being the Word who was with God, who is God. Uh, Mark opens up, John the Baptist is already doing ministry uh, in the wilderness, and then Jesus comes from Galilee and is baptized in the Jordan River. But Matthew and Luke, we have the details of that first Christmas story. Uh, before we get into our text this morning, let me remind you of, that Luke is a doctor, he's a physician, he's a traveler a, 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 with a, a companion of the Apostle Paul. He's a Gentile who wrote one book, two volume, Luke Acts. He's a man who wrote to, he's writing this gospel account and the book of Acts to a nobleman, a Roman nobleman named Theophilus. The purpose, as we see in Luke chapter 1, is to write an orderly account of things that Jesus accomplished, the things that Jesus did and what, the work he did while he walked among them physically. Acts talks about what Jesus continues to do through the church, through the Spirit. Um, Luke carefully investigates, we see in chapter 1. Uh, speaks to eyewitnesses, follows things closely so that he can give us an accurate account, a historical account of the birth, the life, the ministry, the cross, the resurrection, the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we said, no one in the first century would have thought this be a legend, no matter what your professors tell you. It's an accurate account of Christ. And he does so, as you see in chapter 1, Luke writes this because he wants us to know for certain these things that took place and we see in the first few chapters specifically, he does so in the context of Old Testament promises, New Testament fulfillment. We're calling the series Mission to the World because it is Luke, the human author inspired by the Holy Spirit, inspiration by the Holy Spirit, shows us the love of God, the compassion of God, the mercy of God, and the grace that extends to all sinners, even the downtrodden and the rejected of his time. And he loves all people, all nations, all tongues, all tribes. Luke began, we saw last week, his narrative with the announcement of a forerunner. John the Baptist, chapter 5, verse 25, the forerunner. John's purpose was to pave the way, to prepare the people, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Verse 17, through the, the message of repentance, metanoia, to change one's mind, change one's direction. And now this morning we have the announcement of the Messiah himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of the Most High, the, the Holy Son of God, Luke will tell us. So we're in Luke, that's our scripture lesson, chapter, verse, uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 26 through 38. Four simple headings. Um, we'll see the appearing of Gabriel again, we saw it last week. We'll see the announcement that he makes this time to Mary. But last week to Zechariah, John's father. Uh, we'll see the answer that Gabriel gives Mary. She's bewildered which she should be, understandably, and then the acceptance of Mary. We'll see Mary's faith in the end. Typical plot, you know, you have your scene, you have your, your overarching scene, you have your um, conflict, resolution. It's beautiful the way God inspired Luke to do that. So, as we saw, and we'll look again in chapter 1, verse 26 through 29, we have this, again, appearing of the angel Gabriel. As Luke reveals this narrative, it's obvious as you read the narratives yes, last week and this week together, uh, John's announcement, uh, Jesus' announcement, there are several things that are similar. John, that's purposely done that way. The text tells us that both John and Jesus were born to women of faith. Elizabeth and John, we saw last week, were people of faith, and now we see Mary, a woman of faith. We saw last week, too, that both of these narratives speak about God's chosen vessel, that God chose them to be a part of his divine intervention. Both of them were unable to have children, Elizabeth and Mary. Both narratives give us the miracle birth. The birth of these two sons announced by the angel Gabriel he said to both of them, both Zechariah and Mary, and not to be afraid. We see that in the text, too. In both narratives, it is God himself who names their sons. Both narratives, it's clear that with the naming of their sons, we see something of the mission of John, of Jesus. The similarities. But there are a lot of differences. I think even more so, more important, that Luke wants to see 
the differences of what's going on. And the scene shifts from last week. Last week the, the scene was in the temple in Jerusalem. The holy city of God. So now we see not only a non-temple setting, but to a village, Nazareth, of no significance. So from the religious centerpiece, the center point of Jerusalem in the temple to a backwards town that really had a reputation. We learn in John 146, can anything good come from Nazareth? The angel visits, in the first narrative we saw last week, an elderly, high-status male priest who was given the opportunity for a very rare ritual in the temple, the burning of incense. We saw that last week. Now he shows up to a young female with really no status according to Scripture. Elizabeth, John's mother, was barren. Mary, the mother of Jesus, had never been with a man at all. These are differences. Elizabeth's reproach, as she called it, was removed by the birth of John. Mary, a young virgin teenage girl, was not married and would gain reproach by Jesus' birth. John is a, a prophet calling out in the wilderness, we'll see. Jesus is a king, the king, of David, king in David's line, who has an everlasting throne. John would say of Jesus, and, uh, John would say, Excuse me, Luke would say of John that he was great before the Lord, verse 15. But Jesus would be great. There's no qualification there. John would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus would be conceived by the Holy Spirit. Luke is obviously showing us similarities, but differences for the purpose of showing us from the lesser to the greater to ascribing Jesus more glory. He is, he is in every respect in, uh, 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 superior Infinitely superior than John. But even with that differences, the similarities and the differences, look with me at the text and see this, the, that the humble beginnings of the Lord, it's just remarkable. The, the humble circumstances of Mary, the humble condition of the Savior's birth, tells us something from the very onset of this story, of the condescension of Jesus and his humility. We don't know how old Mary was. Most, most people say that a girl of her age, excuse me, and of her time and her background could be as young as 12 to 14 years old. Ligon Duncan says, from before his birth, it was appointed that he would be born to this obscure maiden from an obscure city in an obscure region into a relatively poor family for your salvation because of his amazing, loving condescension in his redeeming work. And doesn't that point to something about God's purpose in Jesus' own humility? End quote. Luke wants us to see this morning. God wants us to see this morning. The amazing, loving condescension of God in the work that he's doing here to Mary and in Nazareth. By choosing her, by you doing it this way, God was beginning to show us all that Jesus will accomplish in his humbleness, in his humiliation. All that he had to endure to save sinners like you and me. Right off the bat. Isn't that Philippians 2 all about? What Philippians 2 is all about? How God's plan of salvation required Jesus to humble himself, taking on the form of a servant, leaving heaven's glory and coming as a, as a man, taking on the form of a servant. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And isn't that what God says that now as the God-man he is highly exalted? That's Philippians 2. Jesus first had to enter into the misery of our lost, fallen state to save lost and miserable and fallen people. We see that all over. What better way to show the humbleness of Jesus than to be born in Nazareth by a young virgin girl named Mary? God's grace, family, comes to those who are lowly, who are humble, not who are self-righteous, not who are arrogant, to the humble and the lowly. That speaks to our hearts this morning. Are we humble to receive the grace of God? What else can we learn from the scene? Let me remind you what the betrothed means, be, being betrothed. It's an engagement, but much more serious, uh, much more binding than it is today. Uh, it was a legal binding pledge that took place between a man and a woman. There was a formal witness agreement uh, between the families. There was a giving of a bridal price. If someone was sexually involved with someone else before the wedding day, it would actually be considered adultery. Usually it lasted for a whole year. 
If someone, uh, uh, that's the first thing we see, that's the second thing we see, dif- um, we learn from this lesson. So we see the condensation of God, the binding betrothal of Mary, but look at the fulfillment and promise, that, uh, the fulfillment of what God promised a long time ago. Notice in our text, it says, Mary is betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, not just Joseph, of the house of David. So Luke wants to introduce us right there in chapter 1 uh, that, that David is from the line, uh, excuse me, Joseph is from the line of David to prepare us for what the angel is going to reveal. He's letting us know. So you have the condensation, the, condensation, the betrothal, the, the fulfillment, and now let me state the obvious. Virgin girls don't give birth to baby boys. Right? Now she's whether she's 12, 13, 14, 15, whatever, she at least knows where babies come from. Right? We can all agree. So what we learn from this text, that God comes to this young virgin girl because of his grace. Look what it says. Greeting, O favored one. The Lord is with you. God was with her. God wants to bless her, not because of her own merit, but because of his grace. In fact, the angel used the word favored one, verse 28. That comes from the same Greek word, karos, grace. And God's grace is upon her. Now, if you come from a Roman Catholic background, which I do, you may be familiar with this prayer. I'm sure you've heard it before. If not, um, this will be your first time. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Some biblical language there, but the prayer in and of itself is fundamentally not only not true, but scripturally completely unsound. For it considers Mary as the source of grace rather than the object of grace. People pray because they think that Mary, because according to this prayer, is full of grace. The Lord is with you, full of grace. That, that's a, a, a wrong interpretation of the Latin Vulgate. We won't get into it. Our church fathers use the Latin Vulgate. But our Bibles, our New Testament, were written in the Greek. When you go back to the original language, it's not that she gives grace. She has been given grace. She's the recipient of God's grace. She's not the source of God's grace. The ASV that I'm preaching from rightly translate that Greek f- phrase as the favored one. In fact, the voice is a passive voice in the Greek, and it is uh, the subject is being acted upon. Mary is being acted upon. It refers to that which Mary has been given to her by someone else, and that, of course, is the grace of God. God's choice of Mary to bear this child springs from his grace, not from any moral perfection or inherited righteousness of her own. She's the object of God's unmerited, gracious provision and goodness. Look what she says next. She's perplexed, verse 29. She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. The atarasso, uh, aggravated, upset. Uh, troubled, she's discerning, NIV wondered, as it's an accounting term, she's, she's d- deliberating within herself, like, what is going on here? She's sizing up the situation, she's trying to think and weigh things out, like, what is going on? Why is this angel here? How is this, what, what does this all mean? She didn't ask for, or, 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 you know, she didn't ask for or seek the role that God has given her. God simply stepped into her life in the grace of God and brought her into the service, into what God was doing, redeeming mankind. And she's wondering, what's going on? What's happening here? Mary is for sure a blessed woman who alone, the only woman in the universe to give birth to the Son of God. We should never overlook that. But Mary must not and should not be worshipped or prayed to. She is honored not by bestowing grace, but by showing us that God's grace comes to lowly people. Kent Hughes I, I, I sums it up so well. She is blessed indeed. Just because others have thought too much of her, we must not imagine that our Lord is pleased with when we think too little of her. We, as part of the subsequent Christian generations, are to call her blessed, end quote. We're not bashing her. We're giving her the status of the scripture. And that, that speaks to us. 
He, he's, he wants to identify this woman who's blessed of God, who's God's grace been poured out in her life. The, the blessed woman who will carry the son of God, the eternal God in her womb. Blessed is she. And God's grace comes to the humble. That's what we can learn. God's grace comes to the lowly. And what, what, this, what these verses speak to me about, I hope it speaks to you about as well, is that we can't save ourselves. All of salvation, the promise, the fulfillment, the sending of Gabriel, the miraculous birth are part of God's unearned, unmerited grace. Rejoice with that. The Lord comes to needy people, who, who, those who realize that they cannot save themselves, they cannot, and that they are weak, and that they are spiritually bankrupt. And God's grace comes to the lowly. God's great grace comes to the, the humble. God initiates it by bestowing grace on his people. Beautiful. The appearing of Gabriel. Now notice the announcement, verses 30 through 34. Gabriel, by the way, does not tell Mary his name like he did Zechariah. But like Zechariah, he has to tell her, fear not. Do not fear. You know, again, like I said last week, when an angel shows up, there are lots of reasons to be afraid. He tells her, don't be afraid. And again, like in verse 28, verse 30, Gabriel uses the phrase, uh, for you have found favor with God. Okay, not a dispenser of grace, but a recipient of grace. God's favored her. He chose her. He looked over the whole earth and he sent Gabriel to Mary in Nazareth. There's something to be said. Mary's been graced by God. And the result of God's grace in Mary's life resulted in a child. You'll bear a son. You have a son, Mary, and you will name him Jesus. Hebrew, Yeshua, Joshua. The Lord saves. The Lord is salvation. And just with John the Baptist, uh, God exercised his sovereignty, prerogative, by, by, by naming him salvation. And this is the first, you know, real scene that we see in, in Luke, that Jesus would be the savior of the world, that he would bring salvation by dying on the cross in humility and, and, and rising again in glory. From the announcement of his birth, his name testifies to the saving work. Jesus is salvation. In the gospel, according to Matthew, we see the same angel, Gabriel, show up this time to Joseph. And while Joseph was contemplating, finding out his betrothed is pregnant, divorcing her, it says in Matthew, the angel says, don't fear to take, oh, the angel says to Joseph, don't fear to take Mary as your wife. Continue on with the, with the, with the betrothal and the uh, uh, marriage itself. Don't fear. Take her as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. You don't have an option. That's what you will call him. And then Matthew adds, for he will save his people from their sins. Salvation. And then in verse 32 on, the angel begins to tell us about Jesus. I see at least the fourfold description. Number one, he will be great. He will be great. The rest of humanity, all not that great. Jesus, he'll be great. John the Baptist, remember, was great before the Lord. There was, there was no, it was an absolute. There was, a, there was a, a qualification before the Lord, not with Jesus. He, he, there is no qualification, just that he is great. No limit, no qualification of his greatness. In fact, many times when you find that term, he is great, in context with God himself, There's no qualification, it's just that God is great. Jesus is great. By saying that he is great, he is pointing to the deity of Christ, as we see the next description. Not only is he great, but he will what? Call the son of the most high. Gabriel is used uh, similar language, verse 35. He's the holy son of God. When Gabriel says he, he's called a son of the most high, the word most high is clearly a description of God it is one of the favorite expressions of King David in the Psalms, a title to speak about the Lord. He is the Son of God, Son of the Most High. In, um, in, in Semitic language in ancient times, 
Uh, when we talk about the sun, we're talking about, they were talking about a carbon copy. They refer to sons as someone who possessed the father's qualities. And when we talk about Jesus being the son of God, we're saying he is the son of the same nature as God. God himself in the flesh. If you look in scripture, you will see the term son of God used in different forms, in different ways. I realize that. I'm, I'm sure you do as well. There is a sense in which every child of God has been bought by the blood of Jesus as a follower of Christ is a son and a daughter of the Most High. But this title belongs to Jesus in a very different and a very unique way. When we talk about the Son of God of the same nature, we're talking about his divine sonship, his eternal identity as the second person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God, three persons. There's so much scripture to support that, but I just want to give you one verse when it talks about the Son of God. And that's in John chapter 5. That is a great chapter. We preached that a few years ago. I, it, one of those chapters just stuck in my mind for, for a long time. Because Jesus shows the beauty of his deity in John 5. It says this in John 5, 19. Jesus talking. The Son does nothing of his own accord. Okay? As a child of God, through the blood of Jesus... I do a lot of things on my own accord. The son does nothing of his own accord. And it goes on. But only what he sees the father doing, for whatever the father does, that the son does likewise, whatever the father does. That's a whole different ballgame in saying, you know what, I need to love others because God loves others. I need to be holy because he is holy. I need to be a peacemaker, uh, Matthew 5, so, so uh, you know, that I can show myself as a son of God. That's all one thing. But to say whatever the father does, the son does likewise, no one says that. No one says that but the eternal son of God. The son, the most high. Number three, he will give to him the throne of his father, David, Gabriel will speak of the, of the throne of David, the Messiah, the expected one who would come according to David's line. Clearly, clearly, Gabriel is speaking about the covenantal promise that was made to King David in 2 Samuel 7. There's no other answer for it. Remember, Jesus' Davidic descendant uh, was already alluded to in chapter 1, verse 27. Now he's describing him as David, sitting on David's throne. So, even the ancients in that day, I know Joseph was his stepdad. You may say, well, he was considered as Joseph's son in line of the Davidic lineage and the promise made in 2 Samuel. When we get to chapter 3, we'll look at the um, uh, genealogy. Some people say it's Mary's genealogy, that she too is from David. But whether that's true or not, Jesus is, is David, excuse me, Joseph's son and therefore heirs and, and one who is, uh, receives all the covenantal promises through his father Joseph, his stepfather Joseph in the lineage. So he will be a descendant of David. And last, verse 33, he will reign over the house of Jacob for how long? Forever. His kingdom, there will be no end. He's the Messiah. He is, the, he is overseeing the house of Jacob, described as Israel. That's Israel. An eternal kingdom. A Davidic king who will reign and his kingdom will never, ever end. Think about that for a minute. This is what Gabriel is saying. It's a fulfillment of Isaiah 9. We went through this. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Shoulder of the increase of his government and peace, there'll be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth forevermore. <laughs> the inaugurated with the coming of Jesus and it will be consummated in his eternal reign over the earth. God told King David who wanted to build him a temple. God told him no. Solomon will do that, 2 Samuel 7. But he tells him that I will establish a throne of your kingdom forever, David. 
I will be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. Your throne shall be established forever. That ancient promise that Israel was waiting for is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the son of David, who will reign as an eternal king, not only over Israel, which we will see as we move through this gospel account, but of all the world, all tongues, tribes, and nations. Is the final kingdom which God will establish. So just think about this for a minute. Just, just think. You're 13, you're 14, however, young girl, hick town, same thing every day, probably maybe doing some pre-marriage preparation, an angel shows up (laughs) and says, I know you're a virgin, you've been sexually pure, and God's pouring his grace on you, you're going to have a son. You may be thinking, that doesn't sound like grace. (laughs) And not only a son while you're a virgin, but you're going to call his name salvation, really, Maybe she didn't understand the whole thing, but he goes on. He's going to be great. He's going to be son of the most high God. Not only that, he's going to be great son of the most high God, but we're going to give him the throne of his father, David. You know, all of Israel has been waiting for this. All the fulfillment and all the the, um, festivals and all that we were excited about is going to be in your son. And your son, by the way, Mary, who's going to be born, is going to reign and rule eternally forever. You think she would go, okay, got it, thanks. I appreciate you telling me that. Actually, when looking at this, you might think she'd say, go find someone else, please. (laughs) Why are you laying that on me? Are you kidding me? I'm from Nazareth. Like, Verse 34, Mary says, how shall this be? How will this be since I am a virgin? Mary doesn't ask the question in unbelief like Zechariah's doubt. She was a woman of faith. When Zechariah received the promise of a son, he said, how shall I know this? He's like, I'm not sure whether I should believe you, angel, or not. I want some sort of confirmation. Give me some sort of sign. Mary's question is totally different. How will this be? In other words, she wanted to know how it would happen. Unlike Zechariah, she believed the angel. She's just curious, like, Okay, I'm a virgin. How is that going to happen? Maybe she was thinking, is there something I need to do? Am I going through my wedding? How is this going to happen? She's not asking, can you do it like Zechariah did. She's saying, how are you going to do this? Her question builds on faith, not unbelief. That's why Gabriel rebuked Zechariah, and he does not rebuke Mary. The announcement of Jesus. I didn't change the slide. The answer of Gabriel, I should say. Oh, let me go back one. Can I go back one, guys? Yeah, okay, I said, answer Gabriel. Now, <laughs> the answer Gabriel gives to Mary that she was going to conceive by the Holy Spirit, you think, okay, that's enough. But I can only imagine if you're a doctor and you're like, well, how does that actually work? Like, I, I, I know how babies are born too. So Dr. Luke is going to add some more detail of what the angel said. The angel answer to Mary is, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Now, before we look at this text, can everyone in this room, you don't have to raise your hand, can we all agree that you're not as smart as Almighty God? Okay, I say amen. Nor are you or anyone in this room omnipotent, like all-powerful, creating the universe. Can we all agree? Amen. So we can all agree on that statement, then we can all agree that within God, Almighty, there's mystery, right? Right? Or you'd be him. So if we cannot figure out all that God does, it does not mean that it cannot and will not happen. Gabriel gives us enough within the mystery for us to have some idea of what God is doing. That's my premise. If you go back to Genesis 1, you read in Genesis 1, chapter 1 and 2, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And God tells us in this uncreated state, there was formlessness, there was emptiness, there was darkness. And then he says, and the Spirit of God was what? Hovering over the waters. The Spirit of God brooding and hovering like, like, like a hen over her eggs or her chicks. And this, 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 this world without form, without void, or that was void and darkness. And then God said what? Let there be light. 
And what happens? Light turns on. God begins to create all kinds of living creatures. The earth was now formed and shaped and structured by the omnipotent creator God himself. It is almost as if Gabriel is saying to Mary, do you remember Genesis 1? Right now, nothing in your room. There is darkness. There is no form. There's emptiness. But the same spirit that hovered over the darkness in the beginning of the creation will overshadow you. And the omnipotent power of God, you will, by the omnipotent power of God, you will conceive and bear a son. There's been a lot of false religions and heresy being taught around that incarnation. Muslims think that Christians would say that Jesus' son, because they had sec- the father had sexual intimacy with Mary, that's what they would blame Christians. They, they, they think that's disgusting, and so do I. Muslims think that. Mormons believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he's the half-brother of Lucifer, who became many gods, and again became the physical offspring of God the Father through procreation. Jehovah Witnesses, he's a created being. We see from this text the verb to come upon you occurs several times in Luke Acts. It's, it's the same verb form as used in the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament, in Isaiah. And all the texts together make it very crystal clear. It has nothing to do with sexual intimacy. Zero. And the verb will overshadow you is a figure of speech both used in the Old and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it's in Exodus 40, how the, the cloud covered the tent in the, in the wilderness. The glory of the Lord filled the temple. There was a covering, a tent of meetings. You know the story in Exodus 40. The glory of the Lord filled the temple. In the New Testament, that verb is used. Um, if you remember the transfiguration of Jesus, how the Holy Spirit overshadowed in the transfiguration of Jesus, him and, and his apostles. So there's a mystery? Absolutely. Absolutely. Completely no information? That's not true. As God created out of nothing through the Spirit, spoke it into being, he created this unique Son of God. As God's presence and miraculous activity overshadowed the people in the Old Testament and New Testament, on the mountain with Jesus, he created this unique child. So how does she become pregnant? Without intimacy with a man? The answer is mysteriously simple. I don't know how else to put it. The presence and the power of Almighty God that he's been doing from the beginning. This is the miracle of the virgin birth that we confess as believers. From way back, the Apostles' Creed. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. The Nicene Creed. God the Son was the incarnated, incarnated by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. One theologian, Donald McLeod, he's a Scottish theologian, says this. Her pregnancy is an act of divine grace. Explicable not in terms of human insemination, but in terms of the creative power of the Holy Spirit. When we deny that, or if we deny, or if we say that's not important, we are denying the faith. We're denying the deity of Christ. We're denying the conception by the Holy Spirit, and that which makes him what it says in our text, holy Son of God, verse 35. It's the work of the Spirit. The one whom you bear, Mary, will be the Holy One. Otherness. Nothing that we've ever seen. He is the supreme, sacred, and consecrated one called the Holy Son of God. Now, the word holy we know means consecrated, set apart. But I think here it means more than that. I think it's talking about his purity, his divinity. He's the holy, pure one. Family, Jesus had to be born of a woman to be human. In fact, I believe if we could actually get a picture of Jesus, I think there's a resemblance of Mary in his humanity. But if he had been an offspring, listen, if Jesus was the offspring of Joseph, then he would be corrupted by the guilt of Adam. It is through the seed, through the offspring of Adam, that sin is perpetuated. Scripture is clear, 1 Corinthians. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ, if you've been born again, shall be made alive, 1 Corinthians 15. Romans 5, just as sin came into the world through what? One man, and death through sin... So death spread to all men because all have sinned. It is the virgin birth 
It is the virgin birth that preserves the, the, the humanity of God. It is the virgin birth also that protects the deity of Christ. His conception by the Holy Spirit points to his deity and his human nature comes from his birth of Mary. One person, two natures. Very hard, very, very important to see. We could not produce a savior, a sinless savior. Sin is part of our life. And that's so important to see that God in the incarnation needed that to take place so that God, that Jesus could be fully God and fully man. He could be the source of righteousness. God himself lived a perfect life. He could be a source of salvation as he gave his life on the cross. Human sin, human sacrifice. Totally righteous. You see the God man, Jesus Christ. He, uh, Paul tells Timothy, he's the only mediator between God and man. That Jesus was sent into the world, lived without sin, fully man and fully God, and was able to die on the cross. And we see that here in this story. And just in case you had trouble believing, God gave Mary a sign. I have a sign for you, Mary. Unlike Zechariah, he asked for a sign. Mary got one anyway. It was a sign to prove that he is sovereign. Mary, there's already someone who's pregnant who was called barren. It's your relative, old Elizabeth, six months pregnant. And the angel told Mary to prove not only his sovereignty, but his power. His power, which he declares, look what it says, nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. God was able to bring a child from Elizabeth's barren womb. He'd be able to bring to this virgin woman a son. And listen, if God could perform the miracle of the virgin birth, let me tell you something about God. He's mightily able and capable of handling a situation and difficulties in your life this morning. Nothing is impossible with God. He is sovereign. He is all-powerful. He is omnipotent. He's God Almighty. Comes to the humble. And speaks about his grace. And is able to do whatever he chooses to do. And finally we see in the end here the acceptance of Mary. Could it be, family, could it be that Mary understood that God's grace was upon her? That she was able, because of God's grace, she was able to move beyond her doubts or beyond, excuse me, her fears? To be able to say, you know what, whatever God's will is, I'm okay with that because God's grace is upon me. He already said it twice. That the grace of God was, was, was in my life and that it melted away everything or every concern that she was able to step out in faith. She trusted God, verse 38. Mary said, behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And then the angel departs. She said, I don't know how this is all going to work out, but I know right now I am in the known will of God, and I'm going to trust him. He's bringing about the salvation of the world. He is sovereign over the affairs of all mankind. In fact, I don't see how this is all going to work out, but I'm going to trust him. Your word Gabriel comes from Almighty God. I will stand by him. I will trust him because he's spoken his word to me. Sometimes the fears we face and the uncertainty of our lives are just melted away. When, when we're standing in the presence, in the loving grace of Almighty God. And God's calling this Mary to step out in faith in order to be a part of his glorious, gracious, divine plan. But being part of God's plan for Mary and for some of us may cost us something. But she knew God loved her. She knew that God's grace was upon her. Hebrews 11 says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Mary had that assurance. Mary had that assurance. She was able to do this because she took God at his word. You notice she doesn't say, well, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got some objections here, you know. She didn't try to negotiate. Hold on. Is there, is there another way we could do this? You know what? I, I need a better explanation. I'm just not hearing it. All she needed to know was God's grace was upon her life. All she needed to know what God said to her, what will happen. And once she, once she knew, that was enough for her. And she was ready to do it. Mary, I'm sure, was concerned, had fear, had, had questions. But she submitted to those Words that God spoke to her. 
Zachariah, on the other hand, we know him. I want a sign, man. I, 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 I want to stay in control. I want you to do for me what I want. And he said, show me. And the angel's like, okay, you won't be able to say anything for nine months. There's your proof. Mary was willing and open to, sh- to be shown the grace. She said, I, I, you know what? I'm not going to drive this ship. I'm not going to drive this car, right? I, I'm not going to be on the driver's seat. You do it. Sometimes we doubt. We use our doubts. We use our questions. We use our arguments to stay in control of our own life. Closed-minded doubts, we call them. Really filled of pride, and, and we're, we're cynical. We, we don't want to know the truth. Or other times when we come and we say, Lord, speak to me. Lord, show me the truth. I'll trust in what you says, what you say. What kinds of doubts are you have this morning? What kind of doubts? Are you willing to hear the word of God? Are you willing to hear through the power of the Holy Spirit and the word of God and the people of God the truth? Mary asked how. Zechariah said, show me. You be quiet. <laughs> think of all the things that Mary had to give up. I mean, just think for a minute. Her stepping out in faith. That's what it's all about. Her acceptance and saying, you know what? I believe. I trust you in your word. Think of all the things she had to give up. Pre- teenage girl, pregnant. I got to go tell Joseph. We don't know what Joseph's going to do, right? Even if Joseph were to stay with her, her community, her little town of Nazareth knows exactly what's going on. And believe it or not, back in the first century, you can count to nine. Nine months. What was your marriage wedding date? Okay, when was the baby born? Like, they could figure that out. Imagine the gossip in the town. And Mary says, you know what? A life of disgrace, I'm a servant of the Lord. Bring it on. I'm willing to give it up. If that's what the Lord wants, that's what the Lord spoke, that's the Lord's will in my life, I am willing by faith to step out and to trust God. And she surrenders to God by faith. That's how, that's how we are to respond, aren't we not? Faithful people respond to God's plan. Even when they don't understand it, we have his word. It's what it means to trust. It's what it means to have faith without troubles, our impossibilities that we face. We trust the Lord. We believe in his word. Even if we suffer reproach as Mary did. Are are we willing, are you and I willing to be God's servant? Slave actually is the term. Surrender to his will, surrender to his word, submit to him, give up control. Putting things into his hands rather than twisting them in my own. Live for God no matter what people may think or say. I'm gonna stand on God's word. By the grace of God. By the grace of God, grace of God through the faith, through faith in God. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to say what Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Someone once said there are three miracles of the nativity. Three miracles of the nativity. One, God became man. Two, that a virgin conceived. And three, that Mary believed. And the greatest of these, he says, was the last. Before we leave this section, and we're going to look at this next week, I want you to see one other thing. As we go to communion, Mary is told by the angel, this, the sovereign power of Almighty God, that your relative, Elizabeth, has a child. Immediately you'll find, once she gets the answer, we'll see next week, she literally, I don't even know if it was that day, but soon after she's told that, she gets on her horse and she goes to visit Elizabeth. I think part of that reason is to talk through this with her older relative, to, to, to contemplate, to think. And sometimes we need community when we have doubts. We need community when we have fear. We need community to work things out together. She didn't work this out by herself. She went to go, I'm going to go see my relative, my older, obviously much older relative. And then after they meet, we see this beautiful song of Mary. We see the song of Mary. It's important to see it's done, that God answers our questions and or processes our doubts with one another. When we're struggling together, seeking God together, we can find him. This communion table in some way is about community. It really is. It's about community. It is about God's people coming together, reminding us all our need of salvation. 
Like Mary, we approach it by faith, believing that God has provided salvation through the cross. The blood, the, excuse me, the, the bread on the table and the cup represents the body that was broken, the blood that was shed. This table here, as we go into communion, is not a King's Chapel table or a Baptist table or any other table. It is the Lord's table. It is the Lord's table. You're a follower of Christ. You made a, a profession of faith. You have been born again by his spirit. You're a disciple of Jesus. You are welcome to come to the table. If you are not, and you're here, and you're contemplating, you're thinking through some things, we love you. We're glad you're here thinking of it together as a community. But this table is for the children of God. As the band comes up, let me remind you. Pastor Ricky's going to lead us in music. Guys, yeah, grab your communion. We're going to spend some time singing, contemplating, as we say all the time, confessing and repenting of sin. And when you're ready, you can come up, grab the elements, sit back down. I will come up afterwards, this, after this song, and we could partake of the bread and the cup together. You come down the aisles and head back. So let me ask you, do you have doubts? Are you standing on the grace of God? Are you recognizing and willing to say, use me, Lord, however you see fit? And finally, lastly, salvation is a gift that cannot be earned. It is all of God. It is all of God's grace. If you've never trusted Christ, if you've never acknowledged your sin, turn from your sin, it's called repentance, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, let today be that day. Promise made, promise fulfilled. Let us pray. Father, thank you that you have given this portion of Scripture to us to see the humble estate of Mary, your gracious servant, a woman of faith, an example of faith, who points to the person and the work of Jesus, who gives us grace in a time of need. Father, we are in need of salvation. We cannot save ourselves. We do not have the righteousness required to stand in your presence. So we want to rest in the finished work of Jesus, who lived the life we could never live, a perfect, obedient life of righteousness that is imputed, that is counted to us by faith alone. And Father, we pray that as we spend some time contemplating the work of the cross, your spirit would work in our hearts to see the beauty and incalculable worth of Jesus in the gospel. So, Father, as we celebrate communion together, we pray your blessing upon us, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.